last time's acceleration, and as was mentioned last week, the total torque, so this is total torque, is I times alpha. I being the moment of inertia or rotational inertia, and alpha being angular acceleration. So I want to talk a little bit about what I is. Now, I know it's going to excite you, so just try not to get too excited. I'm going to go through a derivation. There's going to be a lot of letters all over the board. Instead of just sort of throwing up, here's the formula for moment of inertia, I want you to actually see it come from somewhere. It's some stuff that we've done. Questions on this before I erase some stuff? I think almost, almost all of Hewitt's examples, the torque, the force is either parallel or anti-parallel to the moment arm, in which case there's no torque. That's like by pushing on the end of the door. Or it's perpendicular. I don't think it deals with strange angles, at least not when you have to do calculations. All right, I'm going to ask that question for you to answer in unison. Here we go. What's the formula for kinetic energy? One, One half mv squared. squared. I definitely heard voices from over here. This side seems to be rather quiet. Let's see, with a little bit more uh, gusto over here. Everybody, what's the formula for kinetic energy? One half mv squared. Uh, at least I heard more voices over here. Practice at home. Talking to your kids or your spouse or parents or neighbors. Oh, neighbors, they love it. Yeah, no, how's it going? Hey, okay, it's one half mv squared. And they'll look at you with great admiration. I assume. Just let me know how it, how it works. All right, so if I know the mass of the object and I know its speed, Plug in, no problem. Let's go back to our door, our one and a half meter wide door. If this thing is rotating, it's not all traveling the same speed. If I think about anything that's traveling in a circle, so if I've got a a rod that's spinning around in a circle, I know the speed is the distance divided by time. And the distance this travels is definitely farther than the distance this point travels. That's a bigger circle than that is. It takes the same amount of time to go all the way around, but this is traveling faster than that is. Matter of fact, what is the distance around a circle? 360. A distance. Um, pi r squared? The other one. Pi r squared is the area. I figure people usually know two formulas about a, from a circle. Or they have at some point known two formulas, judging from the exasperation. R squared? Yeah. Generally, when your distance is a linear thing, so you're generally going to have just one variable there. If you have a squared term, a squared variable, generally you're talking two dimensions. Cube, or you have, if you're multiplying three variables, then you've got three dimensions. It's a quick and dirty rule of thumb. First off, what is that called, the distance around a circle? Pardon? Circumference? Yeah, circumference. So the distance around circumference. A 
assuming that would be enough to include to get people to remember remember the formula. <laughs> it's coming back to haunt you now. Ah, uh, spoiler. 2 pi r. Or pi d if you want to go with diameter, but 2 pi r. So if I have something going around in a circle, the time it takes to do it is called the period. So if we're going for, for one revolution, The speed would be 2 pi r divided by the period. And period is just for repetitive motion, the period is how long it takes for one cycle of whatever be repeated. So period is a capital P? Yes. Okay. It's a very specific case for time. Now, there's a relationship between this speed right here and angular speed. Flash back to your notes from last Tuesday. We're just going to do a little transliteration here. So the analog of linear speed, or V, is omega. This is an omega. What is the rotational analog of distance? Or position, displacement. Uh, angular displacement. Okay, so if we're talking distance, just the angle that it goes through. And the rotational analog of time? Mine. Yeah. So my angular speed is just the, the angle that it's rotating through divided by time. So if I got something traveling in a full circle, what's the angle? Definitely need unit zero. Uh, theta is more of a variable. 360 what? Degrees. Okay, 360 degrees. Have a good one. Yep. So, for one revolution, oh, there we go, for one revolution, the angle that it goes through is 360 degrees. Sure, I've done this way 360 degrees. Why is it 360? Because it comes back to the point it started at. Yeah, but why 360? Why not 400? Why is it not 400 degrees? Because that would be going past the point after a full rotation. So you're still making the assumption that it's 360 degrees. Why did they come up with 360 to begin with? What was that? It looks nice. 360 looks nice? Okay. <laughs> they decided it was 360. There, there's actually religious significance to 360. Religious significance? Yeah. 180 is a half turn. Does uh, that have something to do with sacrifice? Uh, I don't know if there's sacrifice involved or not. Because <laughs> I, I, I guess I haven't done the Babylonian routine. I have done it. Yeah. I have not. Okay. Babylonians realized there was significance in the number 60. 60 actually is an interesting number in the fact that, well, one, they had a base 60 system, or we're base 10, they have base 60. If you think about all the things that go into 60 evenly, one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, 10, 12, 15, 20, 30 and 60. There's a bunch of numbers that will go into 60 evenly. 
So 60 had some had importance to them. They also recognized that an equilateral triangle, the fact that you have a triangle, you have three sides for, that are all the same length, and those angles are all the same, also had significance. And this is one of those pure things, thus the religious connection. And so they associated the two, and so that's 60, that's 60, and that's 60. I don't think they used the term degrees at that point. So if I take an equilateral triangle, and then I can put one next to it, that is a horrible triangle. And they put one next to that, and then they put one next to that, put one next to that, put one next to that. You actually can fit six of these things in together, make a trivial pursuit. And so since I have 60 here, 60, 60, 60, 60, and 60, I got 360. That's where it comes from. I don't know what point degrees was starting to be used. In the 18th and 19th century, there was a huge effort, at least I believe this is the time period, a huge effort to try to bring things down to as pure math as possible. Because the 60 came from the Babylonians, so this is obviously somebody or a group of people decided that was going to be 60. But they realized if I take a circle, all circles have a radius. I can take that link and I can wrap it around the side. So if I wrap it around the side there, so the arc length there is R, this angle is the same no matter what circle you pick. Any circle, I can take the, the length of the radius and wrap it around the side, and it will create an angle here that is the same no matter what. That is a radian. From the mathematician's point of view, it comes, this seems to be a pure unit. So now the question is, how many of these radiuses can I fit around the outside? Well, I can get two pi of them. All the way around on the outside is two pi radiuses. So it's two pi radians around the circle. So 360 degrees is equal to two pi radians. So for something traveling around in a circle, its angular speed could be 360 degrees divided by the period, or two pi radians divided by the period. And two pi happens to be convenient right now. Oh, I guess I got some space right here. Because my speed is 2 pi times the radius divided by the period, which is 2 pi divided by the period times the radius. That is just the angular speed. So we have a relationship here between speed and angular speed. The farther you are from the center, if something rotates, the faster you're going. So go back to the wheel. As this is rotating around, I've got a sticky note right here, and then I've got a piece of tape right here. The sticky note, they have the same angular speed, it takes the same amount of time to go around the circle. But the sticky note is farther away, it's traveling faster. Now, yeah. back to torque, or kinetic energy. Back to kinetic energy. I have a door here that's spinning around, or over here. My door is spinning around. I have my hinge right here. That's my hinge. Not everything on this door is traveling the same speed. The point out here is traveling faster than the point down there. So, mass of a door, yeah, you can take it off the hinge, put it on a, a balance, or you can find the mass easily enough, relatively speaking. But what do we use for the speed? If I want to find the kinetic energy of this door, what speed do I use? Velocity. 
uh, just looking for speed. If I ask for the speed of the wheel, not the angular speed, but I'm asking for speed, what point would you pick to represent the speed for the entire wheel? Because this point is traveling faster than this point is. Take a guess. What what would you recommend? I would assume like the outside, right? Why? What's your thinking? Because it's the fastest. That would. So if the, if you want to use the outside, you're assuming at that point you're assuming every point on the door is traveling basically at that same speed. That would way overestimate the kinetic energy if you take the fastest. If we were all running running through, uh, if we were all running on campus, and you asked, "What's the kinetic energy of the class?" What the essence of what you suggest, suggested is, let's take the fastest person and assume everybody's traveling that same speed. That'd make us look like gods. <laughs> Assuming, I'm assuming somebody in here can run fast. Yeah. Any other suggestions? Is there a way to have like the average of uh, of all of the points? Yes, there is. That's where we get into moment of inertia. I was. Sort of expecting someone to say pick the middle of the door since that's basically half the speed between the outside and the very inside well of course if we take the inside here we could get an estimate for what the treat that as sort of an average speed what we really need is an average speed squared not the average speed but that's the average speed right there we can do slightly better if we break this into two pieces and we look at, so we look at this is half the mass of the door, that's half the mass of the door, and then we look at that speed there and that speed there. That would get us a little bit better estimate. Or taking Chansey's first suggestion, we could get a really crude estimate by picking the outside part of the door and then break it into two pieces and then for this piece, figure out the speed at that point for this top piece and this speed for that piece. So if we did it that way, so one half, I'm gonna call this mass one and mass two. This would be mass one times speed one squared plus one half mass two times speed two squared. So basically what we're doing is we're breaking it into smaller pieces. Where mass one and mass two add together to get you the total mass. What could you do to get a better estimate? Why don't we take five? We'll come back. <laughs> Didn't you say Omega was angular velocity or velocity? Angular speed. I need to put a vector symbol over it. Yep, it is angular speed. So what did it make this? I don't know. It was written on the board about five minutes before we broke. Again? Torque equals R S. Uh, not torque was not in it. Wait, is it? 
Is it omega equals theta or time or delta theta? I wrote the formula shortly after that. Is it this formula? Oh, so close. It's like you did not write down that the equation right after that one. So what's the formula that relates them? B equals omega if the R is what? Radius. Distance from the center. All right, so V equals omega R. That's the equation we're working with. So my speed to omega is 12 radians per second. And R, it's two meters from the center. You know, things rotate about the center. Uh, so that is two meters. So that's 24 meters per second. We have 50 miles per hour. Do not get hit by this door. So our crude estimate here, it's one half times the mass of the door, which I made 10 kilograms, times the speed squared. Now we're going to use the big numbers, but anyway, we have calculators. What is the kinetic energy? Twenty-four squared would. Oh, I forgot what the thing was. Is it two thousand? Two thousand even. Oh wait, I did twenty squared instead of twenty-four. Wait, two thousand eight hundred eighty. Say it again. Two thousand eight hundred eighty. That that sounds reasonable. 2,880 joules. Yeah, so, I got that too. Okay, so we have a crude estimate. This is actually, as we talked about before, treating the fastest point as the speed of everything is gonna give us a higher number than it really is, but we, we have a number. Now I'm gonna break it down into two parts. I'm gonna look at this part right here and this part right here. So estimate number two. My kinetic energy is the kinetic energy of part one plus the kinetic energy of part two. We've done the same, the total kinetic energy, just add up kinetic energy of each part. So this is one half times the mass of half the door, 